I'm kind of the other end of the spectrum from what you've been hearing the last couple of days. And it's not to diminish the power of technology because in our work for the last oh, 36 years or so, we've been using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific technologies to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions. You know, we, we tend to think that something has to be, you know, high-tech to be powerful. It has to be a new drug, a new laser, something like that. And what we're finding is that these simple changes that we make in our lives each day, like what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and perhaps most important, how much love and intimacy that we have, that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they really do. And so cows, as they're going off to slaughter, say that my only cancellation is that by eating us, they're killing themselves. Um, that's one way to look at diet. But if you say, if there's an overarching theme of all of our work, it's to ask a very simple, even radical question, which is, what is the cause? I mean, radical comes from the meaning, like a square root sign used to be called a radical. It means to get to the root of something. And the root is really the lifestyle choices that we make each day. If we can treat the underlying cause, if we can turn off the faucet around the sink that's overflowing, then our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing and much more quickly than we had once realized. But what usually happens in medicine is someone has high blood pressure, they say, take these blood pressure pills or take these cholesterol-lowering drugs if their cholesterol is too high or take these diabetes medications. And you say, how long do I have to take them? And they say, forever. It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor? Like, forever. Well, like, well, why don't we just turn off the faucet? And what we find is that when we treat the underlying cause that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing and much more quickly than we had once realized. And in this context, lifestyle isn't just prevention, but it's also treatment, which is a new way of looking at lifestyle that work as well as drugs and surgery and sometimes even better at a fraction of the cost and the only side effects are good ones. And everything that I'll be sharing with you today from a research standpoint was thought impossible when we started doing this work. And it's, uh, to me, that's part of the value of science is to raise the uh, level of awareness to show what a powerful difference these simple changes can make. We started with heart disease back when I was a medical student 36 years ago. And we, I took 10 men and women, put them in a hotel for a month. And what we found is that they not only felt better, but they were better. Eight of the 10 patients showed the beginnings of reversal of their heart disease that they'd had for decades. And we used a new test called thallium. And thallium is a, a radioisotope that... Uh, that goes where the blood goes. And you can see that we're on 10 o'clock up here, there's a part of the heart that's not getting any blood, and 30 days later it was normal. That had never been shown before. People didn't know what to make of that. So I went back to school, uh, finished my MD, did a second study. This time we had a randomized control group for comparison, and we looked at the ability of the heart to pump blood as a marker, a continuous variable marker. And we found that the experimental group who made these changes got better, the control group got worse, the differences were highly significant, and we published that in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Went to Boston, finished my internal medicine training, went to San Francisco, began the third study called the Lifestyle Heart Trial, which was the most uh, conclusive study. In the next slide. And we used quantitative arteriography and quantitative... Uh, I mean, and cardiac PET scans as the major endpoint measures. And in our earlier studies, we found that there was a 91% reduction in the frequency of angina in 24 days. Uh, and, and, and again, they not only felt better, but they were better. Now, this is what we found after four years, after five years, is that, excuse me, this is after one year, we found that in the upper left is a frame from an X-ray movie called an angiogram. You can see where the blockage is, where the narrowing is, where the arrow is. A year later, it's less clogged. And that had never been shown before. And because the blood flow is the fourth power function of the diameter, we found that the blood flow improved by 300%. Blue and black in the lower left is no blood flow. Orange and white in the, in the lower right is maximal blood flow. You can see what a powerful difference these changes made. Uh, next slide, please. And we found that 99% of the patients, as measured by their cardiac PET scans, could stop or reverse the progression of their heart disease. Almost everybody. And so it's not just a, a select few that benefit. And one of the interesting findings that we showed, in the next slide, is that, uh, first of all, the patients got worse and worse in the randomized control group shown in the red line. They showed some in increase in blocked arteries after one year and even more after five years. That's what usually happens to people who get heart disease, is they get worse and worse. But what we found is that instead of getting worse and worse, they showed some reversal after one year and even more after five years. They got better and better. And we published the one-year findings in the Lancet and the five-year findings in, the, in JAMA. Next slide, please. Now, and they also had two and a half times more cardiac events in the group that didn't make these changes. Heart attacks, strokes, bypasses, angioplasties, and stents. Next slide, please. Now, excuse me, go back one slide. Um, 
I'm going to show you a 90-second excerpt from a, a wonderful documentary called Escape Fire. It's downloadable from uh, Netflix and Amazon and iTunes, the usual places. And it's about, it's to, kind of what, to what's going on with medicine, uh, what an inconvenient truth was to global warming a few years ago. And this is a 90-second excerpt of one of those patients 25 years ago, just to put a human face on it. So if you could play that, please. 25 years ago, I had five restaurants in San Francisco. It was a great life. I smoked six cigars a day, uh, 10 cups of coffee, a lot of wine. It was wonderful. And I had a massive heart attack. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I could hardly, uh, just about walk three steps and I'd have to stop and rest. I was popping 20 or 30 nitrils a day. But then Dean Ornish was starting his program to see if you can reverse heart disease through lifestyle change. And he went to my doctor and asked if he could approach me. He told Dean, how long is the program? So he said it was a year. And my doctor told him uh, he wouldn't recommend taking me because he didn't think I would live the year. So he figured I was going to die because I was in such bad shape. And now, 25 years later, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> Mike back. Hello. Thank you. This is not best case. This is representative of what happens when people change their lifestyle. It, most doctors don't see this because we keep doing the same things. And, uh, he did really well. His, his doctor died during that 25-year period, but the patient's doing quite well. Um, and this is a guy who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting chest pain. He couldn't have sex. He couldn't work. He took him an hour to take a shower because he had so much pain. Within a few weeks, he was pain-free and has been now pain-free for 25 years. I'm no longer using a cane or a wheelchair. In uh, November of 2001, I was using a cane to walk with, and I had to have the humiliating experience of riding a wheelchair around Walmart. Now, I didn't like that. I wasn't going to settle for that. I knew there must be a better way. And thank God I found a better way. I no longer have to take my diabetes medication. In fact, my total medication has been reduced by 75%. I had trouble getting to my mailbox uh, without having uh, chest pain. But uh, now I am walking at least two miles a day. I ride my stationary bike anywhere from eight to ten miles a day. One of the interesting findings in all of our studies is that the more people change, the more they improve. I, I thought that the younger people who had less severe disease would do better, but I was wrong. It wasn't how old they were, it wasn't how sick they were. The more they changed, the more they improved at any age, which is a very empowering message to give people. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, we then looked at prostate cancer in the next slide, and we did a study in collaboration with Peter Carroll, who's the chair of urology at UCSF, and the late Bill Fair, who was the chair of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And the next slide, please. And we took 94 men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer and who had chosen for reasons unrelated to the study uh, to do what's called watchful waiting, now called active surveillance. And this enabled us to look at the effects of lifestyle changes alone without being confounded with the usual chemo and radiation and surgery. And what we found is that the group that made these lifestyle changes, their PSA, which as you probably know is a marker for prostate cancer, improved or went down. The control group went up or got worse and the differences were highly significant. Next slide in direct proportion to the degree of lifestyle change. The more people change their lifestyle, the lower their PSA levels went. Now, there are a lot of things that can affect PSA besides prostate cancer. Next slide, please. So we looked at the effects on the tumor growth instead, itself. We uh, sent them down to some, some of the patient's serum down to UCLA and added it to a standard line of prostate tumor cells growing in tissue culture and found that the tumor growth was inhibited 70% in the group that made lifestyle changes compared to only 9% in the control group. Huge differences. And then the next slide, one of the coolest slides, the more people change their lifestyle, in the next slide, uh, the more it actually reversed their, or stopped the growth of their prostate tumors. And the next slide, we also did MR spectroscopy, a new test 
that measures the tumor activity as well as the tumor size. And we found that that was shrinking along with the uh, PSA levels coming down. So taken as a whole, this is the first and still the only randomized trial showing that lifestyle changes alone may slow, stop, or even reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer. Next slide, please. So we wondered what some of the, oh, and also uh, six of the control group patients needed to have surgery or radiation during that time, but none of the group that made these lifestyle changes uh, needed conventional treatment. Next slide, please. So we wondered what some of the mechanisms might be to explain why these patients were getting better. So we looked at their gene expression. And in the next slide, we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months. Now, you're not technically changing the gene, you're changing the expression of that gene, but functionally, it's as though you change the gene itself. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months. And we published this in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences with Craig Venter. Next slide, please. And what we found was that, in particular, the, the oncogenes, particularly the, the, what are called the RAS oncogenes that promote prostate, breast, and colon cancer, were turned off or downregulated. And in the next slide, there's a heat map that shows what this looks like. Red is turned on. Three months later, green is turned off. And along the right column here, these are all different oncogenes. And you can see it's dramatic. And people say, wow, you mean lifestyle changes alone can actually change my genes? Hundreds of them in just three months. Next slide, please. We then looked at aging. In the next slide, we did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize four years ago in medicine for discovering telomerase, which most of you know is an enzyme that repairs and lengthens our telomeres, which are the ends of our chromosomes that control aging. And as our telomeres get shorter, our life gets shorter. And the risk of premature death from pretty much everything, whether it's heart disease, cancer, dementia, you name it, goes up. Now, she had published an amazing study eight years ago with Alyssa Eppel, where she found that women who were under chronic emotional stress because they were taking care of either parents with Alzheimer's or kids with autism, the more stress they felt and the longer they felt stress, the lower their telomerase and the shorter their telomeres. And when they compared the high stress versus the low stress women, they, they calculated that was a 9 to 17 year shortening of their life just from the emotional stress, which of course made headlines worldwide. But what I found most interesting about the study was that it wasn't an objective measure of stress. It was the women's reaction to something, their perception of stress, that actually determined how short their telomeres got. In other words, you could have two women who were in very comparable life situations, but one of them was coping with it much better than the other. And what happened was that if you can, even if you're in similar life situations, if you can manage that stress better, it doesn't shorten your telomeres or your lifespan. So we can't always control what's going on in our lives, but we have a much greater degree of control over how it affects us than we had once thought. Next slide, please. So we presented at a conference together, and I had lunch with her afterwards. I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. And sure enough, this is the study that I referred to a moment ago. We found that the telomerase increased by 30% in just three months. That had never been shown before. Uh, and so we followed those patients for a total of five years. And last month, also in The Lancet, we published a five-year follow-up looking at not just the telomerase, but the telomere length itself in the next slide, and we found that the telomeres increased by 10% in the group that made these lifestyle changes, but they got shorter, which is what usually happens in the control group. Now, this is the first study, uh, control study, showing that any intervention, whether it's drugs or surgery or, or anything, in this case, lifestyle changes, can actually make your telomeres longer. And in the next slide, we found that the more people change their lifestyle, the longer their telomeres got, again, at any age. Now, it's not like there's one lifestyle program for your heart and a different one for your, 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 your um, prostate cancer, your genes, or your telomeres. It's the same lifestyle recommendation for all of these. And so next slide, please. And we also, the Dr. Oz show did a, a one-hour show on our work, and they said, let's pick out our, our four most stressed uh, viewers and put them through this lifestyle program, and, and they did. And just on a lark, we measured their telomere length, and we found that three of the four women showed an increase in their telomeres in just 10 weeks, and with the fourth showed no change. So that really was a mind-boggling thing to me, that it just shows how dynamic these mechanisms are, and how, much, how quickly they can get better or worse, depending on the degree of lifestyle change that you make. And again, the more you change, the more you improve in every metric we look at. Next slide, please. Now, our genes are a predisposition, of course, but our genes are not our fate in most cases. And, I, um, and, and so often I hear people say things like, oh, I've just got bad genes, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, it turns out there's a lot you can do about it. Again, not to blame, but to empower, because if it's, if it's all in our genes, then we're just a victim, there's not much we can do about it. 
And I think part of the value of the kinds of pioneering work that George Church and Esther Dyson and other people are doing, Ann Wojcicki at 23andMe, is that when you can find someone who's got a higher than usual risk of, of a particular chronic condition, say heart disease, if you can then use that as a motivational moment to say, now that you've got their attention, to say, and the bad news is you're genetically at higher risk. The good news is here's what you can do about it. And you can not only prevent it, but even if you have it, you can often stop or reverse it. That's a very powerful message to give people. And, and this cuts across the spectrum. I've been working with uh, President Clinton on his diet since he took office in 1994, and we trained all the chefs at the White House and Camp David and Air Force One that cook for him. And, but when his bypass is clogged up, he was told that it was all in his genes. And I said, you know, it's not all in your genes. And, and uh, you're the last person in the world who should be a, a victim. You're one of the most powerful guys on the planet. And so he began making these changes four years ago, and he's done really well. And here again, whatever your politics, when someone who's that visible and isn't known particularly for eating very healthfully can make these changes, I think that really empowers a lot of people to show that they can do that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we then looked at angiogenesis, and Judah Folkman was a pioneering doctor at Harvard who died a couple of years ago, who found that when tumors grow, they secrete substances like VEGF and others that stimulate blood vessels to grow to feed the tumor because they grow so quickly that they outstrip the normal blood supply. And he reasoned accurately, as it turned out, that if they could give drugs that interfere with those blood vessels growing called anti-angiogenesis drugs, that they could kill the tumors with less toxicity than if they just tried to kill the tumor directly. And so we found in the next slide that we could downregulate VEGF, which is one of those stimulants of, of uh, prostate cancer, and, excuse me, of uh, angiogenesis, uh, by 80%. Just click the space bar one time and you'll see it go down. Red is the control group, blue is the experimental group. Um, this is comparable to what you get with drugs like Avastin and Nexavar, but those drugs cost over $100,000 per patient per year, which we can do for free, and the only side effects are good ones. In the next slide, we found that we could upregulate Oh, sorry, I guess I don't have it. We, uh, we could upregulate two inhibitors of angiogenesis as well as downregulating the stimulator of that. Now, I thought it might be worth taking a moment to, to say, what is it that we've learned that enables people to make sustainable changes in life? And it's not what, what, what I was told, and it may not be what you've been hearing here. Information is important, next slide please, but it's not sufficient. That what's, what really motivates people to change is if, if it makes them feel good if it's fun, if you feel pleasure with it, if you feel like you're freely choosing to do it, if you feel a sense of love and support while you're doing it, that's what makes it sustainable. Next slide, please. The problem is that the whole premise of prevention and risk factor reduction is really fear-based. You know, take this Lipitor so you don't get a heart attack or stroke 10 or 20 years from now, or don't smoke that cigarette, you might get lung cancer, you know, a decade from now. And that doesn't work very well. Uh, next slide, please. The... Uh, Next slide, please. That fear is not a sustainable motivator in any uh, avenue, in any arena, whether it's politics or whether it's medicine. I mean, for the short run, it's very powerful. It's very visceral. You know, if you've, uh, if you've, got, if you've had a heart attack, you'll do pretty much anything that your doctor tells you to do for like, you know, a month to six weeks. And even then, people tend to go back to their old patterns because it's too scary to think about something bad may happen. I mean, what's the mortality rate in this room? Does anybody know? It's 100%, right? It's one per person. I don't want to be the first to break the news to you. We're all going to die. But it's not something we think about most of the time because it's too scary. And neither do our patients. You know, as you, if you tell somebody, take this pill to keep something bad from happening 10 or 20 years from now, pretty soon they stop taking it. Next slide. And this is a very old idea. Uh, next slide, please. And it goes back to uh, the very first dietary intervention that didn't go so well when God said, don't eat the apple, and that didn't work. And that was God talking. Uh, next slide. And if you tell teenagers that, say, smoking is dangerous, that just makes it cool, you know, like James Dean on a Harley. So not only is it not helpful, it's actually counterproductive. So fear is not only not a good way to motivate people, but sometimes it has the unintended consequence of doing the opposite. Next slide, please. Uh, this is from The New Yorker, the, it's called Dean Ornish's Fairy Tales. Then the evil witch tried to lure the children into a house made of onion rings, barbecue potato chips, and bacon cheeseburgers, and the girls all freaked out. Again, that's the most common misconception about my program is like, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I begin making these changes? You take all the fun stuff away. And, and that isn't the case. Next slide, please. Um, the cartoon says, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell. Um, that doesn't work so well either. Next slide, please. Uh, now, if you actually look at the data, it turns out that although the conventional wisdom is that taking a pill is easy and everybody will do it, but changing diet and lifestyle is difficult, if not impossible, it's really the opposite. 
that only about 30% of people who are prescribed any of the statin drugs, like Lipitor or Mevacor, are taking them just three months later, even if someone else pays for it, even if they have no side effects from it. And you might say, well, why is that? And again, they don't make you feel better. At best, they don't make you feel worse, and it's to prevent something bad from happening years down the road that you don't want to think about. Next slide, please. But the paradox is that we're finding that the adherence to our lifestyle program, we've trained now 55 sites around the country from small community hospitals to the Cleveland Clinic and everything in between, and we're finding we're getting 85 to 90% adherence, not after three months, but after a year, to a much more intensive intervention. Why is that? I mean, the answer is because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, most people find that they feel so much better so quickly when they make these changes that it reframes the reason for making them from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. Next slide, please. Now, it turns out that we also found that we could get a 40% reduction in their cholesterol levels, comparable to what you can get with these statin drugs, but without the costs, which are in the tens of billions of dollars, or the side effects. Next slide, please. Now, uh, you know, we're always making choices. It's a beautiful day here in San Diego. You know, you could be doing a thousand different things, but you're here, hopefully it's worth it, because there's no point in giving up something that you enjoy unless you get something back that's better and quickly. And when people make these changes, most people find that they feel so much better so quickly, it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying or fear of something bad happening, which is not sustainable, to feeling good and joy of living, which is. Next slide, please. When you exercise, and because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, you can feel the benefits often within hours and certainly within days to weeks. Next slide, please. And the, more, uh, you f the, the worse you feel, the more dramatic those improvements are. When you eat healthier, when you love more, when you exercise, when you, when you manage stress better, next slide, your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep. Uh, we've all had the experience, we'll have it again probably in the next couple of weeks when you have your Thanksgiving feast. How do you feel an hour or two later? You feel sleepy because you want to take a nap. Your brain is literally getting less blood and less oxygen. But even beyond that, in the next slide, we found that, next slide please, that you can actually grow so many new brain neurons through a process called neurogenesis or neuroplasticity that your brain can get measurably bigger in just two or three months and particularly the parts of your brain that you want to, to grow new neurons, like in your hippocampus that controls memory. You know, when you get older, you start to forget things like where you put your keys and so on. That begins to wake up again. Next slide, please. Now, this is just one of many studies uh, showing that with just walking a half an hour a day caused so much neurogenesis, so many new brain cells to grow that people's brains got bigger. I think that's a pretty exciting finding. Next slide, please. Um, in, the, in those who are 65 or older, uh, the risk of cognitive decline was 38% lower in those eating high amounts of uh, vegetables. So, you know, Alzheimer's is such a major issue, particularly in my family. Um, you know, these are simple things that really can make a difference. You know, we'd, we keep waiting for the magic bullet, the magic drug, the magic high-tech implantable, you know, device, but it's something simple as eating more vegetables. If a drug came out that could reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by almost 40%, it'd be a multi-billion dollar drug. This is just eating vegetables. Next slide, please. The same thing as the fish, which contained the omega-3 fatty acids, had a 60% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. Imagine if you could take a pill once a week that would reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 60%. It'd be a blockbuster drug. Again, just the omega-3, something very simple. Doesn't have to be something really high-tech to be powerful. Next slide, please. Uh, what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. When you eat more saturated fat and trans fat, it more, double, more than doubles the risk of Alzheimer's, or put another way, eating less of that halves the risk of Alzheimer's. Next slide. Now, I like this slide because it really talks about abundance rather than deprivation. Chocolate and tea and blueberries increase neurogenesis, but again, saturated fat, sugar, and nicotine decrease it. Moderate alcohol increases it, excessive alcohol decreases it. Uh, stress management and moderate exercise improvement. Even, believe it or not, cannabinoids found in marijuana increase neurogenesis. I, I'm just the messenger, don't... Yeah. <laughs> what were we just talking about? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Whereas, again, uh, cocaine and, stim and uh, stimulants and amphetamines actually decrease uh, neurogenesis. Next slide, please. Uh, even sex increases neurogenesis. This is a study, they did this in rats because they couldn't get humans to volunteer to then have their brains sacrificed after having sex. But um, if you need to quote me later on tonight, you know, feel free to do so. But the point is, is that it gets away from the sense of what I can't have and more of the sense of abundance, that these are things that actually make a difference very quickly. This is just after a couple of weeks. Next slide, please. Now, your skin gets more blood, so it slows the aging response. Next slide, please. 
Uh, Christy Turlington, the supermodel's father, died of lung cancer, so she has a wonderful website called smokingisugly.com because nicotine constricts your arteries. So in your heart, that can cause a heart attack. In your brain, it can cause a stroke. But in your skin, it makes you age faster and gives you that kind of gray pallor. Uh, I'm 96. I don't know if I look pretty good, I think, but uh, no, I just turned 60. Uh, and, 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 you know, you can talk about, you know, lung cancer and heart attacks, and that just people shut out because they don't want to think about it. But one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was that half of, in the next slide, half of guys who smoke have what's politely called erectile dysfunction or impotent, even in their 20s or 30s. It's the anti-Viagra because it constricts blood flow, whereas Viagra dilates blood flow. And the Department of Health Services here in California had a wonderful ad campaign where they had these billboards in the next slide showing that, uh, uh, you know, you notice the limp cigarette. It doesn't say heart attack, lung cancer, you know, emphysema. It says impotence. Because if you tell a, a teenager smoking is dangerous, like I said, that makes it cool. If you say it makes you ugly and impotent, that's not cool. And it puts it into present tense as opposed to off in the future. Next slide, please. Now, again, the more people change, the more they improved. And, and, the, and the more they change, the better they feel. And the better they feel, they get into a virtuous cycle of wanting to keep doing this because it feels good to do that. It's worth whatever price they pay. Next slide. Now, uh, and again, this is at any age. Next slide. And so... Uh, that's okay. I wrote a book called The Spectrum, if you can go back one slide, that is based on what we learned there, which is that the more you, imp the more you change, the more you improve. Because what, if, you, if you go on a diet, you're going to go off a diet, because diets are all about what you can't have and what you must do. And once you call foods a good or bad, it's a very small step to saying, I'm a bad person because I eat bad food, and then you have all that shame and guilt and anger and humiliation that goes along with it, which is really toxic. And so... Instead of saying these are good or bad foods, I said, you know, foods are just foods, but some are healthier than others. So we simply categorize them from the most healthy group one to the least healthy group five and said what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. So if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you're bad, just eat healthier the next. If you forget to exercise one day, do a little more the next. If you don't have time to meditate for half an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. And just getting started and doing a little gets you into a, a cycle where you're more likely to want to do more. Next slide, please. And so I, I chaired Google Health for three years. And, um, we were working with a lot of really smart Google engineers, and so we were trying to come up with this personalized lifestyle intervention based on all this information. So you plug in your genomic testing or your 23andMe data and your food frequency questionnaires and your three-day diet diaries and your health risk assessments and your goals, and here's your personalized lifestyle program. And one day I thought, you know, I'm going about this in completely the wrong way uh, because we need to make this radically simple and not so complicated, you know. The more you change, the more you improve. And so even if we could come up with a personalized program, and I think that the data will be there, uh, the science will be there in the next few years, it's not quite there yet, still there's that pushback because people don't like to be told what to do. So instead we said, look, instead of me telling you how much you should change, you tell me how much you want to change, how quickly, how many things, and we'll support that degree of change. So like, let's say you want to lower your cholesterol 50 points or lose 10 pounds or get your blood pressure down 10 points, whatever it happens to be. And you say, what are you doing now? Well, I'm eating mostly unhealthy group four and five foods. Great. How much are you willing to change? Well, I'll eat less four and five and more of the healthier one through three foods. Great. How much are you exercising? Well, not much. How much are you willing to do? Well, I'll walk 10 minutes a day. And how much yoga and meditation are you doing? None. How much are you willing to meditate? Maybe five minutes a day. And how much love and support are you getting in your life? Well, not so much. Well, I'll make a point of spending more time with my friends and family. And the next slide, and then we track it. And if that degree of change is enough to accomplish your goals, great, you're there. And if not, you can do more. It's radically simple. Um, next slide, please. I just, this little video that shows that.
Next slide, please. We trained the St. Vincent de Paul Homeless Shelter in our program in San Francisco three years ago, and over 30,000 homeless patients have gone through it. So there's another big myth that this is just for, you know, affluent, educated people. And if homeless people can do it, anybody can do it. And now that Medicare is covering our program, which I'll talk about in a moment, it provides the reimbursement there that enables the entire clinic to, to uh, function without needing ongoing philanthropy. So it's a model we'll be cloning throughout the rest of the country. Next slide, please. And one more. Now, there's this globalization of chronic disease uh, that I, I termed that it, because other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us and all too often die like us. And it's the uh, supreme irony in all this is that the diet and lifestyle program that we found that can reverse all these chronic conditions is what they were generally eating before they started to eat like us and live like us and die like us. And so there's an opportunity now to make an, uh, an important difference because this has only been the last 20 or 30 years this has been occurring. Next slide now. And it turns out that you know, more people are dying today in most of the world from heart disease and type 2 diabetes than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And so it's taken, even in most of Africa, and especially in Asia, and it's diverting a lot of precious resources away from things that really do require drugs, like, like, uh, like, heart, like uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria, to things like heart disease and diabetes that can be largely prevented or reversed by simply changing diet and lifestyle. Next slide. And what's good for you is good for the planet. What's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the health crises and the other crises that we're dealing with. And the next slide, that, you know, like, what can I do? Uh, next slide, just keep going. The energy crisis, keep going. The uh, global warming crisis, keep going. And the health crisis are directly intersecting what we put in our mouths every day. So we can make a difference, even on something as simple as what we choose to eat. Next slide, please. Now, from an energy crisis, keep going. Uh, 20% of the fossil fuel that we burn goes to processed foods, which not only makes it unhealthy, but it takes a huge amount of energy. Next slide. And it takes 10 times more energy to eat higher in the food chain to get the same amount of protein than when you eat a plant-based diet. So something as simple as having a, a meatless Monday can make a huge difference. And for many people, that's worth doing because it's not only helping you, it's good for the planet as well. Next slide, please. Now, from a global warming crisis, next slide, it turns out that Many people are shocked to learn that livestock consumption is accountable for more forms of, uh, of global warming, for a greater extent of global warming than all, all forms of transportation combined. Next slide. Uh, it's 13% versus, in the next one, uh, versus 18% of the transportation. That's huge. So it turns out that you, know, you actually uh, use more of a carbon footprint um, driving a Prius and eating, eating a meat-based diet than driving a Hummer and eating a plant-based diet. So next slide, please. Now, from a health crisis, keep going, three quarters of the $2.8 trillion that we spend on health care, which is really more sick care, is for chronic diseases, keep going, that can largely be prevented or even reversed by simply changing diet and lifestyle. And right now we have this gridlock going on in Washington between many Republicans saying let's privatize or dismantle Medicare or Obamacare, and many Democrats saying let's just keep raising taxes, let the deficit go up. We say, wait, there's a, a third alternative here where we can make better care available to more people at lower costs by, again, turning off that faucet around the sink that's overflowing. Next slide, please. Now, there's a convergence of forces that after doing this work for 36 years that, you know, our time is now, that really this is the right idea at the right time. First of all, the limitations of high-tech approaches like drugs and surgery, they don't work nearly as well as you think. And, you know, information's important. You can be a quantified self. You can have all these, you know, uh, Fitbits and Nike uh, fuel bands and all these things giving you all this barrage of information. But information's just one of many tools. If information were enough to, to motivate people to change, nobody would smoke. It's not like you go to your doctor and say, hey, did you know smoking is bad for you? And they go, I didn't know that. Maybe I'll quit today. You know, it's like you have to ask, why do you smoke and overeat and do these things? And I'll talk more about that. So at the same time that the, that the limitations of high-tech approaches are becoming clear, the power of these very low-tech, low-cost interventions is also becoming clear. And now that Obamacare looks like it's survived the shutdown and the Supreme Court and all these things, the whole reimbursement of medicine turns the practice on its ear. Because before, it was more volume-based. The more stents you put in or bypasses or radical prostatectomies or whatever procedure you're doing, the more money you make because you get paid on a fee-for-service environment. But in Obamacare, it's like, here's X amount of dollars to take care of this group of people. You, the doctor, get to keep what's left over. But if they end up in the hospital because you didn't do very much, then that comes out of your pot of money too. Suddenly, interventions like what we're talking about become much more economically attractive as well as the right thing to do. Next slide, please. Now, 
it turns out that we spent a lot of money on drugs and surgery. In, in 2010, which is the last year we have data, over $77 billion were spent on just two operations, stents and bypass operations. Now you might say, well, that's a lot of money, but think of all the lives it saves, except it doesn't. That's what was so shocking. Next slide. Is the randomized trials have shown that angioplasties and stents don't prolong life, don't prevent heart attacks, don't even reduce angina, unless you're in the middle of having one, which the vast majority of people are not. And so we spent all this money for interventions that are dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. Um, and, and so we're realizing that there's better ways to do things. Next slide. The same is true for bypass surgery. And again, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Bypass surgery, unless you're in the middle of having a heart attack or you have the most severe disease, left main disease and poor left ventricular function, which is about 1% or 2% of people who get operated on, they don't work either. So we spend a huge amount of money that really puts people through a lot of hardship that doesn't really do anything for them. Next slide. Now, you find the same thing is true how the, the surgeon says, I can operate or you can go on a strict diet. He says, well, you better operate because my insurance doesn't cover a strict diet, and that's been the problem. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what I call, instead of evidence-based medicine, it's much more reimbursement-driven. It's like in uh, Deep Throat and Watergate, follow the money. Next slide, please. Now, it turns out you find the same is true for prostate cancer. This is also from the New England Journal of Medicine. A couple of years ago, only one out of 49 men who's treated for prostate cancer whether it's surgery or radiation or brachytherapy or 3D conformal, whatever it is, benefits from it. What happens to the other 48, next slide please, is that they generally become either impotent or incontinent or both for no benefit. So what happens is a guy's PSA is rising, they, get their, they, they find that their PSA is going up, so they get a biopsy. The doctor says, wow, you've got prostate cancer. Good thing we found it before it spreads. Now let's cut it out or radiate it, and then you'll be cured. And they say, thank you. Except what they don't tell you is that 48 out of 49 times, it wouldn't have mattered that you would, be, you would have died with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer, because it's indolent and slow growing. Next slide. And also the New England Journal of Medicine found that after 15 years, the prevalence of impotence and incontinence is virtually universal. So you take a guy who's more often than not in the prime of life, in their late 50s, early 60s, and operate on them, and suddenly now they, they can't have sex, they're wearing diapers, for no benefit at huge economic costs. Next slide, please. So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force said maybe we shouldn't even screen men for prostate cancer, maybe it's better not to know. And that's not to me the right thing, just to put your head in the sand. It's good to know, but then say, wait a minute, there's a third alternative to having treatments that are going to maim you in the most personal ways or doing nothing and sitting under a sword of Damocles and waiting for something bad to happen. It's the same intervention, the aggressive, non-surgical, non-pharmacologic, easy lifestyle intervention. Next slide, please. Now, we then you find the same pattern for type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. It turns out that half of Americans are going to be diabetic or pre-diabetic in the next six or seven years. Half at a cost of over $3.3 trillion, clearly not sustainable. It's already over a third. Next slide, please. Now, it turns out that lifestyle changes are better than drugs at preventing type 2 diabetes. Next slide, also from the New England Journal of Medicine. Lifestyle changes work better than the placebo, better than the drug at preventing type 2 diabetes. Next slide. Lifestyle changes are better than drugs at treating type 2 diabetes. Also in the next slide from the New England Journal of Medicine, and a more recent study that just came out a few weeks ago, they got the blood sugar down with these drugs, but they thought, well, if you get the blood sugar down, that'll prevent the complications, but it didn't. It actually increased the complications. So they had, so the editorial on the next slide that accompanied the article, which is from the New England Journal, which I thought I'd never see, was that we should steer away from drugs and focus on lifestyle interventions. That's pretty radical from where they came. Next slide. Now, the complications of diabetes are really awful. You know, heart attacks, blindness, strokes, amputation, kidney damage, impotence, any one of them would be bad, but together they're truly bad. Now, on the next slide, it turns out that if you can get blood, your blood sugar down through lifestyle changes below a hemoglobin A1C of 7, which is an average blood sugar measurement, then you can prevent all the human costs and all the economic costs. And next slide, please. Now, and that's just what we found when we, we've done this in over 1,000 people in, in uh, West Virginia, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania. We got their hemoglobin A1C from above 7 to below 7 after 12 weeks and remained that way after a year. We also did a demonstration project in the next slide with Mutual of Omaha where we found that most people who were told they needed to have surgery for their heart could avoid it, and they saved in the next slide almost $30,000 per patient, which is, you know, a lot of money to make in the, just the first year. Next slide. Now, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield found that they could cut their overall health care costs by uh, 50% in the first year and by 20 to 30% more in years two and three. 
So again, because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, the economic benefits can be seen in the first year. You don't have to wait years to see the cost savings. I mean, you can imagine if we're spending $2.8 trillion on healthcare and we can cut that in half, that would be a really good thing in the first year. Next slide, please. Now, just to run through these fairly quickly, these are beginning 12 weeks, one year, a 19-pound weight loss. This is actually better than Weight Watchers, but we're not focusing on weight, we're focusing on health. And when you focus on health, there are lots of ways you can lose weight that aren't really good for you, but when you focus on health, every metric gets better. Just showing you this weight, next slide, please. Um, angina falls strikingly, next slide. Uh, and 96.5% and of the patients reported that their angina improved. Again, it's part of the reason we're getting such high levels of adherence, it's because people feel so much better. Next slide. Uh, their ability to exercise goes up and stays up, next slide. The uh, quality of life improves significantly, next slide. The uh, systolic blood pressure shows sustained decreases. Next slide. Diastolic blood pressure, sustained decreases. Next slide. Uh, diabetics show that their blood sugars come down to a normal range. And depression scores are cut in half. Now, if you say, what was the leading category of prescription drugs, the most commonly prescribed drugs in the last 20 years, it's been antidepressants because there are a lot of depressed people out there. And so we found we could, we could get result, reductions in depression better than what you get with antidepressants, but without the costs and side effects. Again, we're not focusing on depression, we're focusing on health and everything gets better. Next slide, please. Now, and Medicare is now covering our program as a, uh, a, a name program, which I didn't even ask them to do. We spent 16 years to try to get Medicare to cover this, and they surprised me by doing it as a Dean Ornish program because they're so concerned about quality assurance and fraud and abuse. And so we partnered recently with a company called Healthways, and we've been training sites around the country. Uh, we've been contacted by over 6,000 healthcare professionals who want us to treat them because we can really create a new paradigm of healthcare that's economically sustainable, which is really a fun thing to do. Next slide, please. Um, and recently, they broadened the coverage through Medicare Advantage and Medicaid to include those with type 2 diabetes and prostate cancer for all the reasons we've been talking about, because the lifestyle changes actually work better than drugs and surgery, not only in preventing these conditions, but actually in treating them at a fraction of the cost. Next slide, please. And they also increased the rate of reimbursement from 37 to 68 to $80 an hour, and beginning in January, over $100 an hour, which again makes it financially attractive and viable for healthcare professionals to do this. Next slide, please. Now, our, team is, our approach is a team approach. The doctor is quarterback, but we also have a nurse, a yoga teacher, an exercise physiologist, a dietitian, and a psychologist, and they all work together as a team. And the doctor isn't really doing that much because we don't really learn about these things in medical school. The doctor is there really just to um, help the, uh, kind of oversee that and to provide kind of as the quarterback, but most of this is done by the other personnel. Next slide, please. And they come for 18 four-hour sessions. Medicare is paying for 72 hours, so they get an hour of supervised exercise, an hour of yoga and meditation, an hour of a support group, which is really the secret sauce that enables us to get such high levels of adherence, and an hour of a lecture with a group meal. Next slide. Now, from an economic standpoint, uh, Medicare is now paying over $7,300 per patient. And at that rate, it becomes economically attractive for doctors to offer this, particularly at a time when the reimbursement is being cut back in so many other areas. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the economic benefits, next slide, uh, is that the incentives are significantly changed, so keep going, so that there's really a double benefit because not only are you getting paid up front, and because, again, because Medicare is paying for it, most other insurance companies are paying for it as well, but because in, this, in the Obamacare environment, the, the less money you spend, the more money you get to keep at the back end, so you get a double benefit because you're getting more money up front and on the back end, which makes it, again, much more attractive. One of the things, I, the reason I spent 16 years to get Medicare to do this is when we first began training hospitals, which we did through our nonprofit institute, we, we got these great clinical outcomes, but some of the sites closed down because we didn't have the reimbursement. And part of what I learned it was that if it's not reimbursable, it's not sustainable. Now it is, and so we can really create a whole new paradigm around this. Next slide, please. And it also allows us to reclaim our roles as healers instead of as technicians. Many of you know uh, Vinod Kosla, who's also a friend of ours. And, you know, he's been going around the last year or so saying that we're all going to get, we all physicians are going to get re replaced by an iPhone app uh, before long because if we're just a collection of algorithms, well, computers do that better than we do anyway. And that's true if that's all we are. But this allows us to actually reclaim our role as not just simply technicians but as healers. And it's so fun to do this kind of work to help people use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming their lives beyond just saying, okay, take this pill or, or do this particular uh, operation. Next slide, please. Now, 
If you go to our website, there's all this information on there, including the reprints, the PDFs of all the research we've been talking about. Next slide, please. Now, the last thing I want to talk about to me is the most meaningful, which is um, the real epidemic isn't just heart disease or cancer or obesity. It's depression and loneliness and isolation because of the breakdown of the social networks that used to give that to people. Many people don't have an extended family that they see regularly or even a nuclear family. They don't have a job that feels secure that they've been at for 10 years or more. They don't have a, a church or synagogue or a, uh, you know, a, a place that feels safe to them. And we all know that these things affect the quality of our lives, but they actually affect our survival and to a much larger degree than we had once realized. Study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to ten times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a, <coughs> pardon me, who have a sense of love and connection and community, in part because you're more likely to abuse yourself and in part through mechanisms we don't fully understand. Uh, and just to show you how powerful these simple things are, in the next slide, this was a study, oh, and again, information's important, but it's not sufficient. You know, like I say, you can be deluged with information, but it's what do you do with that information? We have to work at a deeper level. Uh, next slide, please. Now, it turns out that six months after a heart attack, those people who were depressed were more than four times more likely to be dead than those who weren't, independent of their smoking, their cholesterol, their blood pressure, any other factor. And I don't know anything in medicine that affects not only our quality of life, but our survival to that degree. And yet it's not something most doctors talk with their patients about, because these days so many doctors are depressed, they just don't want to talk about it at all. And so, you know, it's important that we do. Uh, next slide, please. When... Uh, 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 at Yale, when they were doing an angiogram, they found that they gave people a questionnaire. The more people reported feeling loved and supported by their spouse or significant other, the less blockage they had in their arteries, independent of their cholesterol or blood pressure or the usual factors. Next slide. And when you're depressed, your immune system is depressed in all the ways we can measure. And at UCSF on the next slide, they found that men and women who are HIV positive were more than uh, double the likelihood of developing AIDS and dying from it if they were depressed than those who weren't. So and again, every way we look at it, these things make a difference. Next slide. Now, what can you do about that? Well, David Spiegel did a very um, pioneering study at Stanford where he took women with metastatic breast cancer and he found that uh, when he randomly divided them into two groups, both groups got the same chemo and radiation and surgery, but one group met together for an hour and a half once a week for a year, and then they stopped. And five years later, they lived twice as long as the group that didn't have the support group. Now, a skeptic might say, oh, come on, give me a break. You mean talking about my feelings is gonna help me live longer if I got cancer? Come on, that's ridiculous. But it does. And it's so easy to make fun of this stuff as though it's, oh, it's kind of touchy-feely, you know, it's not sexy like high-tech stuff, but we are touchy-feely creatures. We are creatures of community. That's how we've survived as a species, by caring about each other and loving each other and, and supporting each other. And so the, what we found is that our support groups started out as like helping people stay on the diet or measuring their this or that or the other. We realized what we really did was to create a community that feels safe enough for people to be authentic and, and caring with each other. So somebody might say, oh, I may look like the perfect dad, but my kid's on heroin or whatever. And instead of somebody else saying, oh, well, why don't you send them to a drug rehab and fix it or, uh, you know, give some kind of glib advice to say, to focus on their feelings because it's our feelings that connect us and say, wow, that feels horrible. That must be feeling really bad. Or, or my kid's got this problem or I've got, uh, you know, or I used to have a drug problem or what well, this is what's going on in my life. And suddenly it doesn't fix the kid who's on drugs, but what it fixes is that sense of shame or isolation or loneliness that, you know, you don't really have anybody to talk with about that. And it's so meaningful that that guy that was in the first video clip that I showed who was in that film Escape Fire, their group is still meeting 25 years after the study ended. You know, that's it's true, true for all of our studies because that need for connection and community is a primal, fundamental human need that so often goes unfulfilled in our culture, again, because of the breakdown of the social networks. And in business, when you can meet a, fund, a need that's as fundamental and primal as that, you can create a multi-billion dollar business even if you don't do a very good job at it. You know, like the chat rooms in AOL, you know, created this multi-billion dollar conglomerate with time, or, you know, Facebook has over a billion members, 1.3 billion members. It's not the most intimate of life experiences, but it's better than a lot of people have. You know, or even the chat rooms, I mean, over the lounges in, uh, in Starbucks, you know, it's not the coffee, it's just a place to hang out. Even something as, power, as simple as that is so powerful. Next slide, please. Now, I gave the matriculation lecture at the Army War College the last few, four or five years, and I decided this past year to talk about the power of love at the Army War College, which had a bit of a Dr. Strangelove quality to it. And, and I started out by saying one veteran kills themselves every hour, 24 hours a day. 
That's crazy. One, veteran, one, one active duty soldier kills themselves every day, 365 days a year. More, do, more soldiers have been killed by themselves than have died in combat in, in the last several wars that we've done. And so it's really reached a tipping point. So I asked uh, Stan McChrystal, the four-star general who retired recently, uh, if he'd do me a favor, because I figure if I go there as the wuss California doctor talking about love, you know, they're not going to really listen much. But uh, I mean, they, these are the, this is where they train the future generals and joint chiefs of staff from all four branches of the military from 47 different countries. But if he does said something about the power of love, then that would give me more street cred. So this is just an, a, a, a one-minute uh, overview that I showed there that I just wanted to share with you. If you can play that. Next slide. Hi, I'm Stan McChrystal, and thanks for being here today. In fact, I want to thank Dean for letting me be here today. This is the second time I've been able to participate from afar into what I think is his discussion of a really important subject. Then we're gonna to talk today about the power of love. Soldiers love things, they love their truck, they love their dog, they love their kids, they love their wife. But as I grew up as a soldier, it was really uncommon to talk about loving what you do or loving other soldiers. But if you think about why people do extraordinary things, why on the battlefield soldiers will sacrifice themselves, why they will make extraordinary efforts not to let down the comrade on their left or right, it's got nothing to do with fear of co or coercion from their corporal or their sergeant or officers. It has everything to do with commitment and wanting to have a relationship with people and with an organization in which they feel like they've given part of themselves so that they can, in fact, feel like they are a very important part of that team. So when we talk about the power of love, I think it's the most powerful things that move soldiers. Again, you're not gonna stand in the sports bar and talk about how much you love each other. I love you, man. But when people put it on, the equipment, when they really have got to do difficult things, I think that's what makes people operate. I think that's what makes people give. And I think that's what makes organizations strong. Thank you, Dean. All the best. I, I love where he goes, soldiers love them. They love their truck. They love their dog. They love their kids. Oh, they love their spouses too. But anyway. <laughs> but the main point he was saying is that you can try to manage through fear and intimidation, but you can't scare people as much as when somebody starts shooting at them. They're going to they're gonna run. But if they love you, they'll die for you. But that's how powerful love is. Next slide, please. Now, uh, David, uh, Nicholas Christakis um, showed, just as an example of how interconnected we are, that if your friends are obese, you're going to be 45% likely to be obese yourself. If it's your friend's friend, it's 25%. And if it's your friend's friend's friend, it's 10%, even if you've never met them. And it's the next slide. It's, and it's not just obesity, it's pretty much everything. So anything that connects us is healing. And, you know, and as they found, it's, 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 it's the social distance. In other words, getting a phone call or a text message or, you know, with some of the new apps, the health apps that really connect us are really healing. The word healing comes from the root to make whole. The word yoga from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are very old ideas that we're rediscovering. Next slide, please. And so um, in my limited experience, and I've had a lot of experience, but it's still pretty limited, is that anything that creates a sense of trust is what enables intimacy, or, and intimacy is really what enables healing. Uh, because you can only be intimate with someone, you can only be really connected with them on a deep level to the extent you feel a sense of safety and trust. Because when you make yourself vulnerable, you can get hurt. You know, we've all had that experience. So having a safe environment in our support groups, for example, where people can talk about what's really going on in their lives is incredibly meaningful and even healing for them. You know, and I'd ask people, like, why do you smoke and why do you overeat and drink too much and work too hard and abuse yourself? These behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they'd say, you don't get it, Dean. You don't have a clue. These behaviors aren't maladaptive. They're very adaptive because they help us get through the day. They say, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? Or they say, food fills that void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain or alcohol numbs the pain or other drugs numb the pain or video games numb the pain or working all the time, as we've all found, numbs the pain. But it doesn't really deal with the cause. It's still just mopping up the floor around the sink. And what we're saying is like, that pain can be a very powerful catalyst for transforming our lives. We can use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transformation because change is hard. But if you're hurting badly enough, it's like, wow, that stuff's kind of weird, but let me give that weird stuff a try. And then when they start to feel so much better, then it's like, wow, having a heart attack may, not, may have not been such a bad thing. They say, what do you mean? They say, well, because that's what got my attention to begin doing these weird things that have made my life so much more joyful that I might not have ever done that otherwise. Next slide, please. And so, next slide, please. So, 
it's not just how long we live, but I'm more interested in how well we live. And next slide. And what I've learned is what makes these things sustainable, if it feels good, it's sustainable. And because these biological mechanisms are, it really is quick. If it's fun and you feel free, and if it's meaningful. And, you know, spiritual teachers throughout, you know, the centuries have, have really taught, the real spiritual teachers are really happy people and have taught how to live a joyful life right here and right now. Not about, you know, you're going to go to heaven or have something in the future. Right here, right now, these are the things that free us from that kind of suffering. Uh, next slide. And so... One of the things that you find in all spiritual traditions is that you, is you, you don't eat everything that you want, you know, or you don't have sex with everybody you want. You say, well, why is that? You know, I mean, and, and the dietary guidelines are different. You know, in one religion, you can eat this, but not that, or on certain days, or, you know, after midnight, or whatever it happens to be. It's like, is God mixed up, or, you know, what's going on? And you say, to me, the idea is that just the act of intentionally choosing not to do something that you otherwise could do makes it meaningful. And if it's meaningful, then it's sustainable. It's like, why have any limitations if you don't have to? And I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, and you know, people say, like, why not just have sex with everybody? The more sex you have, the more fun it is, right? And then people began to realize that it's like uh, Ramakrishna, the uh, spiritual teacher, said it's kind of like you know, digging a lot of shallow wells and never, shallow holes and never reaching water, or digging one and reaching the wellspring. And that rather than having the same kind of experience with a lot of different people, suddenly you realize that if you totally commit to one person, then all degrees of freedom are available to you. It's, it, you have completely different experiences with the same person because you have that sense of trust, which leads to the intimacy, which makes everything from sex to just being together so much more joyful and so much more powerful and meaningful because you have that intention behind it. And whether it's great science or great art, the ability to see without preconceptions is really liberating and it, it allows real creative thinking, which can only come when you have that sense of trust and intimacy. Next slide. Um, Again, choosing not to do something is what imbues it with great meaning and purpose. Whatever the, uh, extra, you know, whatever the intrinsic benefits are of not eating certain foods, just the act of choosing not to do something makes it meaningful. So suddenly, instead of feeling like, oh, I've got the ball and chain, and oh, I'm feeling so restrictive, and I can't eat all this stuff, it's like, I am choosing not to do these things because it's going to help global warming, or it's going to help me live longer so I can see my kids graduate, or dance at their wedding, or whatever it happens to be. That's ultimately what made, even Bill Clinton was saying, I want to uh, you know, be around to see now that my daughter's married, I want to watch, watch my grandkids grow up and dance at their weddings. So meaning is very powerful. Next slide. Uh, Viktor Frankl uh, found, and, and also meaning is malleable. I found when I was in college, I got suicidally depressed when I was in college, when I was at Rice University in Houston, that I could take all the meaning out of something. And that made it not much fun at all. It's like, you know, who cares? So what? Big deal. You know, nothing matters. I mean, the worst thing about being that depressed is that you, um, you're seeing the world through shit-colored glasses, is the way I describe it, and everything is bad, and, you, and everything will always be bad. That's where that sense of helplessness and hopelessness, which is a hallmark of depression, comes from, is that you really think you're seeing things clearly for the first time, and you're in this reality distortion field where everything is bad, and you really think that all the times you ever thought you'd, you'd be happy, you were just fooling yourself. It's not like just having a bad day. You say, well, tomorrow I'll be better. It's like things will always be bad. That's what being clinically depressed is like. But then I also learned as I got older that I could put meaning into anything. And the more meaningful it is, then it makes it more fun. Even sacred, not sacred in the sense of dry and dusty and boring, but sacred in the sense of the most special, the most fun, the most erotic, the most intimate, the most joyful, the most playful, the most meaningful. Next slide, please. Um, Viktor Frankl wrote about this 40 years ago in a book called Man's Search for Meaning, that what enabled concentration camp survivors? Why did some people do better than others? It's kind of like what Liz Blackburn found with the women who were taking care of kids with uh, autism or parents with Alzheimer's. If you have a sense of meaning, I got to get out of here, I got to live through this concentration camp so that I can watch my kids grow up or so that I can do whatever it is that brings meaning in my life. Those are the people who, uh, who, who do the best. Next slide, please. Um, and again, that makes it the most fun. Next slide, please. And so uh, the, the last slide, the last two slides I want to show are that the, uh, the spiritual traditions that you find through all major uh, religions and spiritual traditions, uh, what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy or altruism, forgiveness, compassion, and love. Again, that's what frees us from our sense of separateness and isolation. I, I remember the very first day of the very first study that I did when I was a medical student, we had two guys who were part of the 10 people. One of them was an older guy who was very homophobic and the other guy was gay. And the older guy said something really awful to the younger guy and the other guy said something really awful back and they started yelling. One got chest pain, took a nitro. The other took chest, got chest pain, took a, a Demerol. 
slam the door, slam the door. I thought, wow, these guys are going to get a heart attack and die. This is going to be the end of my very short research career. And I talked to them. I said, you're giving the power to give you a heart attack to the guy that you hate the most. That's not really, is that selfish or unselfish to be more compassionate and forgiving? Well, it doesn't condone what the other person does, but it frees us from that sense of suffering. So the last slide is really what I'm just um, so passionate about in doing this work is that it enables us to use the experience of suffering, either ours or the people that we work with, as a doorway for transformation, for really transforming our lives for the better. Now, I think all these devices and technology are great, but we don't have to wait for the next breakthrough to begin transforming our lives. We have the tools and technology already, and we've already shown, using these very high-tech, state-of-the-art measures, that in every metric we look at, people get better, including their gene expression, including their telomeres is the most recent finding. And it's not that there's one program for this and another one for that, which isn't to say that some people need specific recommendations, but for most people, it's the same program for all these things. The more you change, the more you improve. And that's why I love doing this work, is because people get so much better so quickly, it's really fun doing it. And now that Medicare is covering this, we have a chance to really use that experience of suffering in the healthcare system itself to transform it for the better. So I want to again thank all of you for the chance to be here today for the amazing work that each of you is doing and hopefully this has been at least a little bit useful. Thank you so much.